Today, on Ancient Insight, we will be exploring the abstract English word God, specifically as it is found in Shamawat, Exodus 34, 6-7. And he passed Yahuwah by front of him, and he proclaimed Yahuwah, Yahuwah God, compassionate and gracious, slow of angers and abundant of love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands, forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin, yet to leave unpunished not he will leave unpunished, punishing sin of fathers on children and on children of children, to third ones and to fourth ones. In modern Western culture, the word God is often spelled, or at least thought of, with a capital G, and over time has come to carry the connotation of being the name of the Creator, as described in the Tanakh or the Bible. We will often say phrases such as, God bless you, thank God, and believe in God. But rarely, if ever, does anyone ask, which God are you referring to? This is likely a result of the substantial influence that monotheistic religion has had on Western culture. But the Bible is not a Western book, and this is not exclusively the way that the word God is used in the scriptures. And if we are unaware of this, it can lead to confusion, such as when the Most High instructs us to have no other gods before him, or when the psalmist exclaims that Yahuwah is a great king above all gods. Let's dig into this ancient word to see if we can gain any insight into what a god is. The word god, as used in Shamawat, Exodus 34.6, is translated from the ancient Hebrew word al, which is spelled with the pictographs al and lam. Al is a two-letter root, not modified by any prefixes, suffixes, infixes, or what collectively are referred to as affixes. We first encounter this word in Barashiat, Genesis 14.18, in the phrase al alayawan, translated as most High God. You may notice right from the start that the word which we are exploring is identical to the first pictograph which it is spelled with. Al is the Hebrew word translated as God in the scriptures, and it is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, so it may be difficult, if not impossible and unnecessary, to distinguish between the exploration of the pictograph Al and the word Al. The pictograph al is a picture of the head of an ox and is characterized by the action to yoke, the concrete object ox, and the abstract concepts of strength and primacy. Considering these varying facets of meaning together seems to point to a core notion of influence. Let's see why by taking a closer look beginning with the concrete and objective facet, the ox. An ox is a domesticated bovine, or what is commonly referred to as a cow or bull. Now as we begin to picture this animal, don't be too quick to think of old Bessie out in the field, quietly chewing her cud, or even the matador's opponent. These are the bovine we know today, but keep in mind that over a period of thousands of years, humans have selectively bred cows to be smaller and more manageable. Imagine instead a cow with the size, strength, and speed of a draft horse. What is being represented in the pictograph Al is quite likely a much larger, stronger, more fierce and menacing beast than today's farm-bound moo cow. More like the ancient Aurak, or the more recent American bison. A creature which could easily be considered the king of all beasts due to its size, strength, agility, and menacing horns. Encountering one of these in the wild would leave a person with a lasting impression of strength, power, and dominance. To capture and tame something of this size and ability would be an exhausting task. Fortunately, there is a method to channel the power of this beast and utilize it to train its offspring, and it's this method 
that leads us to the next facet of meaning represented by the pictograph al, the action to yoke. To yoke is to join two things together. In the ancient culture of the scriptures, oxen were utilized for their strength, to assist in the plowing of fields and treading of grain. They often would work in teams. It was common practice in ancient times to train young oxen by yoking them together with a larger, older, and more experienced animal, in order that the more experienced would influence the impressionable youth, teaching it by example the ways it had learned. This method would be much more efficient and effective than repeatedly chasing down wild beasts and trying to domesticate each of them from scratch. In modern Hebrew, the name of this letter is actually Aleph, which literally means teach and learn, as we see it used in Mashalei, Proverbs 22, 24 through 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest you Aleph learn, or in other words fall under the influence of his ways and get a snare to your soul. The concrete lesson in this is that any time two are yoked together, the stronger, smarter, or to put it most generally, the more influential will cause the lesser to become like it. It's also interesting to note that this proverb indirectly indicates that angry people are more influential. The word anger used in this proverb is af, spelled al pe and carries the possible pictographic implication of strong mouth, influential speech, or even led by or with the mouth. Finally, let's take a look at how the letter al functions grammatically. When used as a prefix to a verb stem, the al indicates a first-person, singular present future tense conjugation, or what we would voice in English as, I do and I will do. Notice here the primary influence, the dominance, the first position of the one speaking as they claim the action being described. There is a core, common vein of meaning running through the various functions of the letter al, from the objective ox with its dominant strength, the action of yoking which extends that strength to another, and the first-person positioning of the al prefix. And this core may be described as the idea of influence, the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something else. The second pictograph in the word al is the lam, a picture of a shepherd's staff. It is defined by the action bind and the object staff. Consider a shepherd for a moment, a human charged with the care of domesticated sheep. By comparison to the sheep, this human is armed with superior height, reasoning abilities, imagination, strength, agility, knowledge, wisdom, and comprehension. But all of these abilities reside within the shepherd, distant and detached from the sheep. How is it possible for the sheep, with their need for guidance, to join together with the shepherd and his need to influence? The answer is the staff. The staff is the means by which the shepherd transfers information to the sheep. The shepherd may know what the sheep need to do and not do, but it is the staff with its pokes and tugs that transfers this knowledge, binding the shepherd and the sheep together. The staff is the bridge between two previously separated entities, which enables communication. Grammatically, when the lam functions as a prefix, as it does in the word lamalak, to the king, it brings the meaning to, for, and toward almost as if it is a linguistic shepherd pointing the reader toward the object it is modifying. There is a core, common vein of meaning running through the various functions of the letter Lam, the objective staff communicating the will of the shepherd to the flock, the action of binding or holding two together as one, 
the grammatical pointing forward of the lam prefix, and this core may be described as the idea of leadership and authority, the knowing and showing of direction. In combination, the pictographs in the word al bring us the down-to-earth ideas, first staff, strong leader, primary authority, influencing lead. Each of these ideas give us an easier-to-grasp, concrete perspective on what a god is. It also helps to clarify for us why, when referring to the creator of the skies and the land and all that is, the word al, god, is modified with the word ilayawan, meaning most high or highest. Modern Western culture has predisposed us to think of the concept of God as an exclusively supernatural phenomenon. But notice how at Shamawat, Exodus 22, 8, the plural word Allahayam, which is derived from the word Al, is referring to human judges. Any person or thing which we yoke to, follow, or allow to direct us is an Al, strong leader, or God to us. It may be an ineffective, dysfunctional, or false God, but if we have placed it in a position of influence over us, it is a God nonetheless. Now that we are armed with this concrete perspective, we can make practical sense of our Father's instructions to us in the Ten Commandments not to have any other strong leaders before him, or more literally, in his face, since he, as the author of all, possesses all authority, all wisdom, and the superior perspective, being the most high, it would be dysfunctional for us to place ourselves under the guiding influence of any person or thing whose instructions contradict those of the Most High. This is not to say that we don't or can't function as leaders, guides, and examples for others. However, in order for our leadership to be sound and functional, we must ensure that we are aligned with the Most High and that any and all instruction that we give points back to Him. Before we conclude, there's an elephant in the room which must be addressed. Of the nearly 5,600 times that the word all appears in the Tanakh, it is only translated as God by the King James translators 242 times. Every other time, it is translated as a variety of prepositions which can all be summed up with the word to or toward. When the word to or toward appears in a sentence, it points to the reason that the subject of a sentence is performing an action. It indicates what is directing the action. For example, let's look at the simple sentence, I walked to the store. I is the subject. Walking is the action. If we stopped at that, shortening the sentence to I walked, we would be left wondering where and why. If we added a few more words, we could have the sentence, I walked the store. We are still in the dark about the reasoning, motivation, or direction for my walking. What led me to do it? The addition of the simple word to, or in Hebrew, al, answers this question. I walked to the store. I walked because of the store. The reason, the driving force, the thing that led me to walk, was the store. This is not a different definition or meaning of al than what we've explored previously in this video. It's actually exactly the same. When al functions as a noun, it means strong leader. When al functions as a preposition in a sentence, it points to the strong leader, which is motivating the subject's action. For further exploration of the prepositional function of the word al, see our video entitled Ancient Insight. God, Part 2. So far in our exploration of Shamawat, Exodus 34, 6-7, the Father has told us that He is life and that He is a strong leader. 
In our next video, we will explore the following attribute mentioned, compassionate, or as many translators put it, merciful. We hope you are finding this helpful. May you bless and be blessed.